what about electroactive species adsorption? Well, once we've got species adsorbed on the electrode surface, we can do some electrochemistry on those species, and that's actually become more and more popular recently uh, for, a minute, for a reason I'll talk about in a minute. Um, <coughs> if we have a, a molecule O, that undergoes an electron transfer to R. Uh, again, because it's not a diffusional problem anymore, the, the, the electrochemistry will be different. Now, for a reversible system, in other words, a system in which the amount absorbed of O and R essentially follows the Nernst equation as a function of potential, we get curves that look like this. And these curves are not dependent on the particular geometry of the material because we're not talking about materials diffusing to that electrode, so it doesn't really matter what the geometry of the surface is. Unlike in a diffusion calculation where it does, you get waves that look symmetrical. I'm not drawing them very well, but let's see if I can draw a little bit better. The idea would be that you'd have curves like this where you'd have a um, peak current uh, cathodic, peak current anodic. The peaks are lined up directly over the top of each other. And after we get past the peak, we drop back to zero again. Why do they have this shape? Why don't they have the asymmetric shape of the CV? Well, we don't have any diffusion going on, so whatever's on the surface can accept an electron uh, directly from the metal. It doesn't have to diffuse in or away, so there's no reason to, exp to not get complete oxidation of all the material on the electrode surface. And so that's what you're seeing by this curve is a initial exponential increase in the uh, reaction but as some of those materials become oxidized or reduced, there's less of those available, so the current then drops until you get to the final point. And it doesn't all occur at, a, at a, um, one particular potential because there's always a, a, a Boltzmann distribution of the process that would give the uh, width of this peak. And so the peak current is equal to the n squared f squared over 4RT times the scan rate A and this term gamma zero star. First of all, let's see that the peak current is directly proportional to area and the sweep rate. The faster we sweep, the more the higher these peaks are going to be. And um, but otherwise it's very similar to the, what we've seen before. Gamma zero star is just a term that includes the uh, adsorption of the oxidized species with time plus the reduced species with time. We can also define this amount here as our half peak potential, so-called delta EP uh, one-half, and that turns out to be three point five three RT over NF, or about ninety point six millivolts per N at twenty-five degrees C. So we increase the number of electrons, the sharper that peak becomes, just like it did in the CV case uh, for diffusion-based processes. And as we increase the temperature, the width of that peak expands as well, suggesting, again, a Boltzmann-type distribution of the, uh, of the molecules. Now, this is suggests that We've either got only electroactive species absorbed on the molecule or on the electrode, or that molecules can't diffuse to the surface and undergo an electron transfer process. So for example, you might absorb some molecules on the surface, transfer it to a solution in which there's no adsorption possible, there's no 
our O and R present in that solution and only the adsorbed molecules can undergo this reaction. Now, as we go to a non-reversible case, I'm not going to really spend a lot of time on that, but what will happen is just like in the diffusional case, the reaction energy, there's an overpotential now and so the peaks will shift more negative for the reduction process and the more positive for the, uh, the oxidation potential. So instead of a symmetric peaks, you'll see an asymmetric peak separation. And you might be confused if you look at this as being a diffusional based process, but the, what will be different from a diffusion and adsorption based process by this, what would be a quasi reversible case. Uh, the peak current would basically still be almost the same. There would be a slight difference from the reversible, but probably within 20% of what you see here. But notice that the current drops to zero in this quasi-reversible absorbed case, which is not, would not be the case for a uh, diffusional based process. You'd always see for diffusion a curve that would be more like that, where you'd see a, a curve above zero. So that's one way to tell the difference between absorption and diffusion, is look for that going down to zero. All right. Now, we can sort of force things to be this way of, of only a molecule being absorbed or reduced. Often what happens though is you're doing an experiment where you're looking at material that is diffusional. You want to look at the diffusion-based electrochemistry of the situation, but the material also absorbs, has a strong enough energy of absorption that will absorb to the electrode as well as, so you get electron transfer not only for the adsorbed molecules, but for the molecules that are um, diffusing to the electrode surface. So if you have both the dissolved and adsorbed molecules or ions are electroactive, then things get a little bit hairy. Uh, Let's take a couple of cases. If we have the product of the reaction strongly adsorbed, what will we see? Well, for the diffusion process, we'd see a, almost the same wave as we'd see for the diffusion if it was not, there was no adsorption going on. So you'd see diffusion alone, you'd see the normal cyclic voltammogram. And again, we're assuming a planar diffusion, a planar electrode here and semi-infinite linear diffusion. Uh, for other geometries, it would have a slightly different shape. But if we have the product strongly absorbed, what we see is a, a pre-peak, perhaps something like that, and a slight shift change in, uh, oops, slight change in the um, shape of the way, but this pre-peak occurring just before the diffusion peak. And so that would correspond to O in the solution undergoing electron transfer. Again, this is reversible in both cases. And we're only talking about the, uh, oops, the product, product being, uh, undergoing, darn it, the product undergoing adsorption here, not the reactant. The reactant is absorbed only to a slight extent. So why is that? Why is this happening? Why do we see a pre-peak? Well, because the, uh, because things are absorbing, that must mean that when you absorb, you're lowering the free energy of that molecule, otherwise it wouldn't absorb. So by absorbing that molecule, you're making it easier to reduce in that system by making the free energy of the molecule less. If it wasn't a pre-peak, that would mean that being absorbed would make it more difficult to reduce and there would be no reason why that molecule would be absorbed in that particular case. 
Okay, so we, once we have that particular process happen. On the other hand, if the reactant is absorbed, uh, you get peaks that look, you know, like this with the CV and then with the reactant absorbed, post peaks like so. And again, same idea by absorbing that reactant, you make it easier to oxidize and so those peaks occur there rather than somewhere else. Okay. Now one thing about adsorption like this, these are strongly adsorbed molecules. In other words, there's a high energy of adsorption for these particular things. One thing you'll notice is particularly with adsorbed molecules, it's not, it's kind of one way to tell if things are getting adsorbed is to adjust the potential at which you start the reaction. For example, if I did the start of the reaction at a more a negative potential, I might see a different adsorption process in that particular case. Because what's happening is that if we start our electrode at a different potential, we're you know, we're not letting the material absorb at the potential of the other one. So there's a different free energy for the absorption of these molecules, particularly for the uh, pr uh, uh, the product particular case. Things are absorbed that way. So that's one way to tell things apart. What about uh, if it's not, if there's not such a high energy of the absorption? Well, what happens when, if the energy changes for this particular process, those peaks are going to shift more negative. As the reaction becomes stronger, the absorption free energy becomes stronger, those peaks shift more negative for the product being absorbed shift more positive, or I'm sorry, more positive for the product to be absorbed, more negative for the reactant to be absorbed, and, um, and that's for higher energies. But as, as the energies become less for absorption, those peaks start to mingle uh, with the diffusion waves, and that's when things get a little messy, because then we have a hard time sometimes telling whether or not absorption is actually occurring, because the peaks are not distinct looking in those particular cases. Um, as we get a weak absorption, for example, a weak reactant absorption, we get initially a wave that might look like that, but with a, a reactant absorption, those, weak, those waves start to mingle in, and we might see a, a wave that looks almost identical to a, a CV, may look kind of a little odd, but you may not necessarily notice anything different about it, but the waves would be merged, and it'd be hard to tell just by looking at it that you've got absorption occurring, so the, the waves would not look quite right. What you'd notice particularly that the peak current would not be proportional to the V to the one half power, as you'd get expect for a diffusional wave, because as you mingle in that Diff absorption wave, remember the absorption processes is a uh, IP is proportional to the scan rate. So with absorption, as we increase the scan rate, you're going to get IP is, uh, is more and more proportional to, to V uh, for absorption. So at low scan rates and high scan rates, you're going to uh, get a um, shift for the peak current being proportional to V to the one half at very low scan rates and then peak current would be proportional to V at high scan rates as you shift to, for the dominance of those, of those two. And uh, for, uh, that's, this is for reactant absorbs. For product being absorbed, you'd have a, a similar thing except the way it would come up a little higher on the, on the forward process rather than the reverse and then so on. Well, it's hard to tell sometimes from the CV. It's a little easier to tell with other methods. One way that people have used to tell if we're getting adsorption on the electrode surface is to use um, double potential step coronal colometry.
the idea here is, remember coronal calometry where we did a potential step and we, we converted the current to a charge or we d directly measured the charge and if we plot the uh, charge as a function of the square root of time, we got a, uh, a, um, a straight line in principle. Now this assumes, A, that the reactant is absorbed. Um, why are we assuming that? Well, the product is absorbed, we can often avoid, uh, we can actually know how much is being absorbed by looking at the charge that would pass for only the absorbed process and the subtracting away from the charge that would be passed from the uh, diffusion process. Well, remember our equation for that, the Q is equal to 2NF a d0 to the 1 half c 2 pi over tau. This is our Cottrellian type boundary condition for chronocoulometry. That's the diffusional part of that. Then there's going to be a adsorption part of that, NFA gamma, plus then there's going to be a charge from the double layer charge. So in order to know how much is adsorbed, what we really want to know is this particular part here, the adsorbed charge. This is the amount of material that's the charge that would be associated with the adsorbed species. How can we do that? Well, remember this, this, this part of the equation should have an intercept of zero, so anything above zero is this part here. So this is the adsorbed and uh, char double air charge. So if we can find out this particular value, we can do it. Well, what people usually do is they do a reverse step. So they step back and they'll see another set of data like this that they plot for the reverse charge and then they subtract off on the reverse step the double layer charge because the double layer charge and the reverse step and the back, the forward step and the reverse step should be equal to each other and they can subtract that off. Um, and you can actually define a time in this case where you can see people are fond of using thetas in this in this particular time frame of uh, electrochemistry. And they said, well, let's define theta as this. And that's just the subtracting off the time it takes to do the potential step. And so the theta on the back, or Q on the, I'm sorry, Q on the back process is equal to 2NF A d0 to the 1 half c uh, uh, pi to the 1 half theta plus qdl. And so subtracting off the forward and the back gives us uh, allows us to subtract off the intercept on the back that gives us the QDL, and then subtracting that again gives us the uh, amount absorbed. All right. Well, let's uh, stop here for a break, and uh, we'll continue in a few minutes.